Middle East, the cradle of Christianity, where Abraham fathered the nations, where Moses freed the twelve tribes of Israel, where Elijah revealed the power of the Lord and was carried to heaven, where John the Baptist proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. These lands witness the birth of our Lord, and these are the lands from which disciples were called and from which they set out throughout the world to preach the gospel. The early Christian community flourished here, from caves decorated with frescoes denoting a holy place, to the development of early churches and monasteries, archaeological evidence reveals that this land witnessed the first fruits of the growing community of apostles and disciples, the first preachers of the good news. The lineage of these early disciples can be traced directly to the wealth of different churches, traditions and rites present to this day. Many of these sites, after the Muslim conquest, has been retained as places of prayer by, many times, by Muslims as well. And uh, wherever you dig open the soil in the Middle East today, specifically in Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, Iraq, you find ruins of churches and monasteries. Although the roots and traditions are deep and the language of our Lord is still spoken here, there is a growing concern after 2,000 years that the future of Christianity and Christians is today under a growing, silent but pervasive threat. The empty monuments, churches and monasteries are no idle witness to the fact that the human landscape is changing, that Christians are disappearing, either through assimilation into Islam or by simply emigrating to areas where Christianity can be practiced freely. The situation of Christians in the Middle East, in general, is certainly in danger. That is to say, that Christians feel little hope for the future, and for that reason, more and more are looking to taking themselves, their children and families, away from the Middle East. For example, in Palestine, in Jordan, and in Egypt, Christians are leaving the Middle East, and this creates a difficult situation. We risk that in the future there will be no more Christians in Jerusalem, the city of our Lord. The reason for this modern-day exodus lies in the growing presence and ever more forceful manifestation of Islam. Christianity's undisturbed presence in the Middle East ended in the 7th century with the coming of Islam. Muhammad, the founder of the new faith, regarded himself as a prophet sent by God, Allah. It was to Muhammad that Allah revealed his will through the holy book, the Quran, a will to which all must submit. Muhammad's teaching brought about a religious and cultural revolution that forever changed man's notion of God and his relationship with him.
Muhammad is for them the fulfillment of divine revelation. And here comes another problem. Uh, our concept of revelation, divine revelation, is totally different than the Muslim concept of divine revelation. For Muslims, divine revelation means the commandments of God as laid down in a book. That means, for Muslims, God gave humans a book to follow, period. We Christians do not share this at all. For us, divine revelation is a person. The Prophet Muhammad showed us the way forward. He was sent to make perfect, to repair morality, as well as morality's most perfect traits. For man, although he can also fall very low, was created so that through his actions he might achieve moral perfection. That is why we must raise people according to the principles of perfection, to bring people to perfection, so that they may live in harmony together with their own people as well as with strangers. The principles of perfection to which Muhammad referred were the foundations of Islamic law known as the Sharia and the expression of Allah's commandments for Muslim societies. In practice, these commandments constitute a system of duties that are incumbent on Muslims by virtue of their religious belief, a divinely ordained path that guides the Muslim towards a conduct that is a practical expression of his religious convictions in this world while preparing him for the achievement of divine favor in the world to come. This collection of laws, prohibitions and injunctions serves the Muslim as a guide to how he should behave in his everyday life, at work, at home, with his family, in the mosque how he should act with those closest to him as well as with total strangers. The Sharia demands absolute obedience. The idea of divine grace, that means a living contact, a personal contact with God. The Arab language does not have a word for grace. It reflects the religious ideas of Quran, which does not know a personal, loving, caring contact between God and people. It doesn't exist. It's a religion of commandments and of obedience. Islam promulgates a system of government as an integral part of revelation, one where religion and power go together. For Muslims, the application of this system is, wherever possible, the obvious extension of their faith, however especially so in countries with a Muslim majority. For a Muslim, life in a society that is not governed by Islamic law will always be abnormal. In places where Islam has a majority by the force of circumstances and which is also written in the holy book, Christians are citizens but not full citizens. They are second-class citizens, so that what is possible for Christians in other countries is impossible for Christians there. People in the West very often have very wrong ideas about Islam. They don't know what Islam is. Islam divides the world in two spheres. Dar al-Islam, the world of Islam, and Dar al-Harp, which is the world of war. That means there are two categories of people. There are Muslims and there are non-Muslims 